Okay, I'm Donna Otto, president of the South Texas Border Chapter Master Naturalist, and this is our little bit of social time before time for the meeting to officially start at 630. And at that time, I'll introduce our speaker, Mr. Barry Knoll, who's already here. And we've just been chatting about uh, various things uh, in the meantime and saying hi. We have several of our new members here tonight. So, um, uh, that's what we've been up to. We have 27 participants online now, and that number keeps going up. And uh, we welcome everybody, especially those on Facebook. We're glad you could join us tonight. Now we have some from this new class, 2022. I have see some students from 2021 and some from 2020. Um, looks great. Great to see everybody. Elizabeth, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself? We've been introducing some of the other uh, officers and directors. If you want to say hi. Howdy, uh, I'm Elizabeth Perdomo. I'm the second vice president and uh, lots of other things too. Um, sort of by default and because I like to. Um, and. Uh, Nice to see uh, your friends here and new friends to be uh, in the new students. Um, and I'm really looking forward to um, hearing uh, Mr. Nall's talk. Uh, I had the good pleasure of getting to see him in person out at um, Leander Acres Garden a, a few weeks ago. I guess, was it New Year's Day? Anyway. Uh, uh, and um, it was really nice to get to see him and hear a little bit more about what he's been up to lately. And I know you all are going to enjoy hearing him in just a little bit. Okay. And I know we kind of introduced Joseph. He's uh, in charge of all this IT technology and the WebEx and stuff, but he's also our uh, first vice president. Uh, back up to everything, probably. <laughs> We impose on him a lot and we're thankful to have him. <laughs> I was looking to see who all was here. We still have a couple of minutes before time to start. I don't want to start too early because people are expecting to hear all of the program. And um, so I want to be sure we, they are, have the best chance to get on. Just looking at the list of names. And Robert. I'm here, Donna, finally. Yes, I was just going to say, I see that you made it on. Uh, Mr. Hernandez is our immediate past president. And so he's very helpful in all, all sorts of ways, knowledgeable about what's the history of our chapter, what's been going on, but gives us advice and, and guidance uh, um, because of his background. He has his roles and duties that he fulfills. So glad you could make it. Thank you. And I like that mystery. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, I have that it is 630. And Elizabeth, did you want to introduce our speaker tonight since you kind of know him a little bit better? Um, well, I. I could, I don't have the papers with all the uh, creds right in front of me, but uh, the, very, the first time I saw him speak was at uh, Quinta Mazatlan at one of those Thursday night talks that they used to do before COVID. Uh, and it was, I was so impressed. It was just such cool and interesting things. He had lots of you know, butterflies there and cocoons and uh, Caterpillars and lots of different stages, which don't get to see hands on night. But, um, I know he has them and he knows what to do to take care of them. Uh, he's um, a high school teacher and a pastor and wonderful naturalist and very diligent in the citizen science he does. And his website, um, which I'm sure he'll share with us, 
it's like the best in the universe. If you want to learn about butterflies and the different stages of life uh, and, and their, their whole life cycle, what they, uh, their host plants, their nectaring plants, uh, everything you want to know. And he's got it all photo documented and anyway, I can't say enough about it. But thank you for being willing to be here with us. Thank you and welcome. And for those of you as he's speaking, if you think of questions, you can put them in the chat. And uh, if he doesn't cover it during the talk, we'll can go back and have those questions answered for you. Thank you. And it's I turn it over to you, Mr. Null. Okay, well, I thank you all for the invitation and um, the kind words. And I hope I don't disappoint after that buildup. Uh, let me get situated here. When I start sharing, the chat disappears. I'll, I'll try to remember to pay attention to it, but if there's a question posted, somebody feel free to interrupt me. Um, I was invited to talk on the effects of the February freeze on butterflies, and I was had not really put together information on that, but I liked the topic because it is something I had tried to pay attention to in a lot of ways. Uh, and I, I think it's uh, a lot of what we've seen this year is probably influenced by that freeze. We lost sound. Donna and Joseph, we have no sound. Yeah, I think he's looking at, at that. It's a, it shows he's not muted. Because yeah. we could hear him just fine just a moment ago. Um, in the chat, he has indicated he's working on this to see if he can figure out what the problem is. So stand by. We occasionally have glitches like this, and we usually get them resolved pretty quickly. Yeah, Barry, Elizabeth asks, is your headphone plugged all the way in? Maybe unplug it and stick it back in and um, make sure that WebEx is using the right input on the, the mute button, that little down triangle. Uh, go through there and check that it's on the right input. How about now? Can you hear yeah. me now? Okay. I'm sorry. I have no idea what happened. Uh, all right. Let's hope sharing doesn't do that again. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. 
right. And you can see my PowerPoint okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. So anyways, I was going to say that butterfly populations change all the time for many reasons. So it's kind of hard to put a finger on exactly what was due to the freeze. But I feel like I do have uh, some insights into some some things that I can I have enough data to make an educated guess. And so these are educated guesses, just so you'll be aware of it. Uh, to kind of remind you of where things are, um, and just to do a comparison, uh, a week ago, we had a freeze out here. Uh, that says January 23rd. That is the wrong date. I'm, January 23rd is a week ahead of now. So I i don't know offhand what the exact date was, but we had 27 degrees about a week ago. And the day after we had 27 degrees, it warmed up, the sun came out, and my chamonke had been blow, blooming. It was not attracting butterflies very much. After the freeze, it was covered. Uh, and, and these are some of the species I saw that day, uh, right after 27 degrees, when I really wasn't expecting to see much of anything. So butterflies obviously can protect themselves to some extent from freezing temperatures. And um, they have, you know, the question in my mind is, why are they, were they on the chamonke? Did the freeze change? the taste of the nectar that made it more attractive or did the freeze kill off all the other nectar plants they were using so that they came over to the chamonke? Uh, that's one of those questions you can't answer, but it'd be interesting to know. But any event, so just having cold temperatures is not going to kill off the butterflies. But last February, we had much colder temperatures. The cold lasted longer. And, and just for comparison, it killed the chamonke. The chamonke was blooming then, it killed the blooms. Um, and even when it warmed up and the sun was out, it was a week before I saw a butterfly and it was in a lot of checker spot, which is why that one's there. Uh, so obviously seven days with freezing temperatures are a lot harder for butterflies to deal with than one day, and that's what we dealt with. Um, so it was definitely an extreme situation, and even butterflies that normally can survive a brief freeze were affected. It, that's my belief. Uh, and so my conclusion, which I just point out, butterflies can find shelter for short periods of time, but the extended cold probably had two effects. One is it killed butterflies in all stages. And I say this because there are many species of butterflies that overwinter in uh, either as larvae or possibly as eggs. That is, the, in the fall, uh, certain species of larvae will actually, they'll grow to maybe they're ready to pupate, and then they'll just stop feeding, but they won't pupate. They'll go into what's called diapause, which is kind of like hibernation. And they just wait until spring conditions, whatever triggers them. They Some start feeding at that time, or some just go straight to pupation and emerge. And in other cases, it's the eggs that overwinter. Uh, so... I'm convinced the cold did kill not only adults, but also the small stages, but also it killed all the nectar sources. And so part of the problem with trying to figure out is what butterflies were killed is I didn't have any nectar around my house to attract butterflies. So if any survived and started flying, there wasn't any reason for them to come to the house. Uh, to give a perspective on the effects, uh, we were talking about this a few minutes ago, I lost tropical plants. A lot of people around me did also. 
I had native annuals uh, like clammy weed that had started to grow because the beginning of February, we had 90 degree temperatures on two days in the first week of February. And, and stuff like clammy weed was growing. I had other uh, flowering plants growing. And then the freeze came and it wiped them out. Fortunately, all that stuff reseeds quickly, so it was no problem. But anything like a pyramid bush, small uh, lantanas, all of those froze to the ground. And even most of our trees lost leaves, and some of those froze back to the ground. So I was looking around after the freeze, and the only thing I saw green, basically, was acacias and a few odds and ends. But it, the, the acacia plants stood out and ebony because they kept their leaves when just about everything else lost it. Uh, but as I say, I saw no nectar, uh, nothing to attract butterflies. Now, in February, I have some records. Uh, I had seen about 20 species, and most of those were before the freeze. Because as I say, we we're having 90 degree temperatures or close to that. In March, I saw a grand total of 22 species. And my 13 year average for March is 45, as I've been keeping records of how many species I see, mainly in the yard, but whenever I get out in the county. Um, and most of these species were small skippers. And I realized the reason they were attracted to the yard is, and in the grass, oxalis was coming up. Uh, if you're not familiar with oxalis, I don't know the common name they give for it, but it's the little weed that looks like clover, but it has a yellow flower and it's always in the yard uh, competing with the grass. And it never, almost never attracts anything to nectar on it, but it was attracting a lot of uh, butterflies simply because they didn't have anything else to get nectar from. And a few of the species I saw, uh, the common streaky skipper, I know that those caterpillars overwinter and, and diapause and then they pupate and emerge. So I was interested that they, survived and the uh, butterflies were out. Nysa roadside skipper, uh, Celia roadside skipper was also out. But the one that surprised me was golden headed scallop wing. And this is not that common a butterfly. They're probably around, uh, at least in Stark County, because they seem to like the waste areas, the dry runs and things like that. Um, but I know that all of these butterflies are going to pupate or be in diapause close to the ground. So they may have been more protected uh, and more insulated against the freeze than some things that might pupate higher up on plants and be more exposed to the cold weather. So basically after the freeze, I really did, I hardly saw any butterflies in February. I saw 22 species in March, which half of normal, that didn't sound too bad. But when we got to April, I was astonished that we only had, I only found 14 species in the whole month. And, you know, that's less than a third, that's almost a quarter of normal. And I feel that this has to be a direct effect of the freeze. The species I saw were the commonest ones, fatal metal mark, glycide, sulfur, pipe vine, swallowtail. And, and these generally move far enough north that you would expect they're a little bit better prepared to face the kind of weather we saw. But what happened to the other species that normally fly at that time? One possible explanation, well, I first wanted to mention this is not an explanation of what happened to other species, but the species I saw in May, March, were probably had laid their eggs and flown a couple of weeks, they were dead. And, and, and the caterpillars were growing, but hadn't started to fly again. Uh, but I'm thinking that the species that typically would have flown in April were those that were most affected by the freeze. 
either the larvae froze or pupae, or if there were adults, uh, perhaps they did not have adequate food. Uh, or for that matter, I had a discussion with a friend of mine. We were debating, were the diapausal larvae killed or did they come out of diapause and not find any food because all the plants had been frozen to the ground? I lean to thinking that the plants had grown back enough that by the time the larvae would have started feeding, they would have found something to eat. But it's, it's one of those things that we really don't have a solid answer for, but it was April and when there was an obvious dip, a very clear dip due to the freeze. And that surprises me because it seems like it was kind of delayed. Uh, but it makes me think that perhaps the spring, early spring flying butterflies are better equipped to handle freezes and as part of the the biology that leads them to fly in the spring. So those were the immediate effects. Uh, from that, I would try to look at the year as a whole and um, gain perspective. And from looking as a whole, I would say the one thing was obvious overall was a decimation of what I would call tropical species. And by tropical species, I'm referring to uh, Mexican species mainly, but that are generally resident or consistently appearing in the valley at multiple times in the year. Uh, pixies are in the valley because people brought guamuchil or pithos lobium and planted it. And they found the trees and colonized, uh, but almost none were seen this year, a very few. Same thing with guava skippers. The guava trees, to my understanding, are, are imported, and the skippers followed them. And these are beautiful butterflies that just are. Uh... Hi, right, where, where was I when things went haywire again? You were talking about the pixies and uh, uh, guava skippers and things. Okay. I apologize. I have no idea what happened just there, but uh, WebEx crashed. Okay. So anyways, um, I have a, a friend who's a fellow teacher here. His, his name is Juan Moreno that lives in downtown Roma near where there are lots of guamuchils and uh, Cecilpinias that the curve wing metamarks feed on. And he would send me pictures of these two throughout 2020 on a regular basis. Both of these butterflies were flying there. And there were reports of guava skipper from other parts. So all of these were resident in de decent numbers. Since the freeze, I've only heard of one or two reports of any of these butterflies. Uh, red rim is another one that generally shows up, maybe not quite as abundantly as the others, but it's another tropical species that if it's been seen this uh, year, I'm not aware of it. And, and so what I suspect has happened is that the majority of these butterflies froze out. Now, a few pixies and uh, I think couple of curve wing metal marks, and I know a few grava skippers have been seen. So one of the th interesting parts of all this to me is that when we look at temperatures and they say, well, we had this freeze, we, we just think of the freeze as a mass of everything's at 20 degrees or whatever it was. But in reality, there are many, many micro habitats. And so it's probable that a few of all of these were able to pupate in some place that protected them. But given the numbers, I think, I, I mean, that, that haven't been seen, I think it will take quite a while before uh, these 
species return to the, the normal numbers that have been seen in previous years. I could be wrong, but I think it'll be a while before they build back up. So that's one of the most likely effects, long-term effects of the freeze is that we just won't see these tropical species, at least not as commonly as, as they have been. All right. Um, another effect is that some very common butterflies were in very low numbers. This is a picture of various emperors. There's Empress Lilia, Lilia, some people say, uh, probably Tawny Emperor in there. There's a Hackberry Emperor, all actually nectaring on mesquite sap. Uh, I see in the chat that Chuck has lost his sound. Is anyone I'm, hearing? I'm still hearing you. Okay. All right. Hopefully he can get his back. Yes, I can hear you too. All right. So they were in very low numbers, at least in Stark County. And since that's where I live, that's where most of my observations are being mirrored from. And the really surprising one to me was snouts. Not that I think any of us really miss them because they're just so abundant, but they were in very no, low numbers this year. And uh, tawny emperors, for, for example, I know often pupate pretty high on hackberry trees. So probably the other emperors as well that are in the, uh, they may well have suffered a lot of attrition due to the very cold weather. Now, I put Asterocampus species because there's some other butterflies called emperors that are much more attractive and eye-catching. And interesting enough, they were in better numbers. But before we get to that, another thing I noticed was very low numbers of hair streaks in general and the absence of all but the commonest ones. I mean, I saw a few gray hair streaks, a few mallow scrub hair streaks, um, great purple hair streaks, but red crescent hair, scrub hair streaks, usually a few show up. None. Marius hair streaks, usually a few show up. None of those. So there obvious were, obviously were some other species that were lacking. Now, can I say that was absolutely due to the freeze and not to other factors? No, but it certainly seems that there would be a, a reasonable correlation. And that just reminds me of something I was going to mention. You know, it's funny that freezing weather does not affect things the same way. Uh, I mentioned we had 27 degrees a week or so back here at the house. Um, and while I was Reflecting on that, I remembered that a few years ago, I found a pristine great purple hair streak that had died when we had a cold slap overnight that I don't think got much below 30, if at all. Well, the day after we had 27 degrees, I walked around the corner of a building and one that was basking on the ground flew up right in front of me. So sometimes butterflies well, I shouldn't say that. I should say that the butterflies, when they protect themselves properly, can survive some pretty extreme conditions. But if they aren't properly protected, they may not. And so these species were in low numbers that might have been expected to be appearing. And like I say, at least a few of these hair streaks just never showed up. Uh, but the other thing I observed is that species that aren't as common appeared in larger than normal numbers. Uh, for example, the emperors I previously mentioned, the Asterocampo species, and snouts both feed on hackberries. In particular, uh, the, the snouts will use desert hackberry, and so will the Empress Lelius. Uh, the species I'm picturing here 
all of their larvae also feed on hackberries, in particular the red bordered meadow mark and the this is a pavon emperor and a silver emperor. These are supposed to feed on the desert hackberries. So without the competition, I'm thinking that. That explains why these three species in particular uh, were found in much larger normals, or appear to me, larger numbers than usual. Um, I have not seen any live myself this year, but I know they've been reported consistently at uh, the National Butterfly Center. They've been seen at Oleander Acres and other places. And usually I would only expect one or two sightings, and I've heard of a, a quite a few more than that. The red border metal marks have been numbers in my yard where usually I'm lucky to see one or two a year. And I had an outbreak of question marks, fresh butterflies, four or five at a time. And, and this was the first year where I've seen that many at one time. So I feel that it seems likely at least that these butterflies took advantage of the uh, more abundant food and therefore more of their larvae were able to grow and mature and we were able to see them. And those of you that aren't familiar with these two, the Pavon Emperor and the Silver Emperor, they're in a different genus than Asterocampa. It's Doxocapa. I not good at Latin, and I can't even remember how it's spelled right now in my head, but one, there's two fascinating things about these. One, they iridesce if you get light at the right angle, the males only. So this one is a female, this one is a male, and you see a little blue. On the Pavon emperors, it would be purple. The other is they have a fluorescent green proboscis. And so if you ever get a chance to see these live, you want to get close enough to see the proboscis. It's just wild to see that. And uh, beautiful butterflies. Wish we would see more of them, but they're competing with snouts. And generally, it seems the snouts outcompete everything, and there's just not much food left for the other butterflies. So here are a few species that seem to have taken advantage of a lack of competition. Another species is Statira sulfur. Uh, these were seen ovipositing on Wamuchu, which is, uh, some people call it Pithyslobium. It's Pithyslobium dulce at uh, the National Butter Supply Center. And I was mentioning I got a chance to get some eggs and raise them. I had to return the, I returned the pupae to the center and they were released there. Uh, the, these are about the size of large orange sulfurs or cloudless sulfurs, but this is a male. They're, they're kind of bicolor yellow. The inside is a darker yellow. The outside is very pale. And the females can have some markings, brown markings. But I've seen them only in the summer. They were regular flyers in, said, 08 was... 12 years ago, 14 years ago, can't do my math, 09, 11, and 13. But I have not seen them or seen reports of them, maybe one or two reports, since 2013. Well, they showed up at the Butterfly Center, and they were laying eggs all over the Pithyslobiums. And as far as I can find, no one has ever reported this species using the Pithyslobiums. Uh, and and the, in a normal year, of course, the pixies would be using it. There are a number of other, let's say, herbivores, moths and moth caterpillars and, and even some other types of insects that feed on them. And large orange sulfurs also feed on them. So it seems to me it's most likely that in most years, there isn't enough of the right kind of leaf to attract this 
the tiras and to support them to breed and, and reproduce. Now, in rearing them, I found something interesting. They will only eat the freshest, tenderest leaves. They prefer the, the large leaves, but when they're so tender, if you like rub them, they just scrunch up and shrivel. And in fact, I struggled because about the time they were getting to the second to last instar, uh, at a time when normally a caterpillar would start to move to the larger, tougher leaves, they refused to eat them. And they chewed on some and, and couldn't eat them. So I had to run around Roma uh, to find some trees. And fortunately, my friend Juan Moreno, his dad had a tree and, and I was able to get some from there and also another one we knew about. But as I was looking at it, uh, Mr. Moreno's tree was a large tree. The trunk was probably six to eight inches and it froze back. So he cut it out, but because he knew we were looking at butterflies, he cut it off at about five or six feet. Well, when I went to that tree in November, I guarantee you it was fully 30 feet tall. It had grown incredibly. The trees at the Butterfly Center looked like they had been cut to the ground. Most of them were probably eight to 12 feet tall or thereabouts. And they were very bushy and they were sending up tons of new growth. And so another possible reason why the Stateras were using them was simply that in a normal year, the tree's grown out, most of the leaves are hardened, there's just a little bit of fresh growth at the tips. So even if a caterpillar eats a tip, it's gotta crawl a long ways to go to another branch to get back up to where there's more fresh material. The fresh material was easily accessible to the butterfly or the caterpillars. They didn't have to move far. And we had had enough rain in November that the, the trees that had a solid trunk were growing pretty quick. My problem was I only had two very small trees and when the rain didn't last, there wasn't enough ongoing fresh growth. But the bigger trees were pumping out fresh leaves at a much faster rate. And so that also benefited the, the Stateras and I really doubt that that would have been the case had the trees not frozen back to the ground. So by changing the state of the tree, that freeze actually probably benefited the Stateras to where they were able to find lots of fresh foliage that uh, the caterpillars could use. And I had forgotten, I, I accidentally collected and reared a large orange sulfur with the Stateras they pupate in like eight days. I'd forgotten how fast large orange sulfurs grow and the satyrs were the same way. These are large caterpillars, large butterflies compared to most, uh, but they grow incredibly fast. And in the summertime, you expect things to mature quickly, but in November, it was shocking to see these caterpillars go from an egg to a pupa in eight days. Uh, so, the absence of some butterflies probably helped others find food and move in. I was hoping that that's what would happen and I was looking forward to seeing some more tropical species come up from Mexico, but that didn't happen. Uh, I would guess that a lot of species in Mexico froze out as well and that's the reason that we didn't see as many uh, in the end. Uh, the one other thing I forgot to mention, another effect of the freeze is it probably killed off a lot of predators. And I was uh, discussing with uh, Dr. David Wagner about this. Um, I said, well, I was, you know, I was wondering maybe the, the Stateras grew fast. I was thinking just to get the fresh foliage, he thought it was predators also because the faster a butterfly matures, the less likely the caterpillars are to be parasitized or eaten. 
Um, but anyways, there probably were fewer predators to attack the young caterpillars and the eggs than, than normal, and that helped the population's recovery. One other thing I noticed is that there didn't seem to be a fall bump this year. Usually in the fall, when the crucita is blooming, starting in late October and especially November, we start to see a lot of Mexican species move northward. Crackers are seen almost every year and, and usually a fair number of sightings, a few sailors almost every year. This year, I don't recall hearing maybe one or two sailors and, and just a handful of cracker sightings. And I saw that recently people are silly seeing Blomfield's beauty, which is a gorgeous butterfly. And if you haven't seen it, I don't know if they're still seeing it. it was, there was one reported at the Butterfly Center, or and there was one, I think, at Oleander Acres. Uh, those are worth making an effort to see. They're just incredibly um, complex on their wing patterns. But those are just showing up now because we've had very moderate weather uh, into where we're at, which would be mid-January. Mid uh, those butterflies have often been reported in November and probably even October. I don't remember looking, but uh, so we just didn't get the species from Mexico this year that we usually do, or at least not the numbers, and which, which shows that since the freeze extended well into Mexico, it affected them, their butterfly populations, as well as ours. So what I would say kind of as a wrap-up, I, I think several sensitive species such as the pixies were decimated, and it probably will take them some time to repopulate. I think that, for example, Roma was probably colder and harder hit than the mid or lower valley. Uh, so you all probably will see pixies in your areas sooner than we see them back in our area. But I certainly hope they will come back. And if anybody has a Wamuchil next year that's getting defoliated by their caterpillars, let me know. I'll be glad to transport some to Roma and provide them with lots of food. Love those butterflies. Um, we lost several sensitive species. Most local species appear to have suffered losses. The spring numbers were down, but I feel like the populations are returning to typical sizes as well as we can estimate because, like I said at the beginning, there's always fluctuations. Uh, but there are still a few. And it, it seems to me that damage to nectar sources was an issue, and also host plants, as well as the, those killed by the freeze. And I'm remembering now, I meant to mention earlier, I read several years ago, I don't remember where I read it, but it was somebody writing about Houston and they reached the conclusion that when the butterflies die off, it's more from lack of nectar and, and lack of food and from dehydration than from cold weather. And I have noticed in paying attention this year that that does seem to have been the case, uh, that if there's just nothing to feed on, what are the butterflies going to do? And, and the same with the caterpillars. Uh, I often get caterpillars in the wintertime, and I often struggle to find them food to feed. So that's, that's an issue, especially when there's a freeze like 2021. But then there are those species that probably benefited, benefited uh, either because no attrition, I mean, no uh, predation, and possibly no competition or limited competition. All right, so I thank you for your attention and I'd like to open the floor to questions if anyone has them. 
Well, first we had a comment on Facebook. Uh, uh, Velma says she saw a red rim at the National Butterfly Center yesterday. And, awesome. And uh, Teresa asked, is there anything we can do to help the butterflies? Well, we can always plant more host plants. And I do have a link on my website to uh, host plants that I've observed butterflies using, a uh, spreadsheet, I believe. Uh, and of course, nectar plants. Um, I try to plant plants that are blooming year round. Durantas, for example, and uh, lantanas, if they're protected, seem to bloom most of the year. A lot of people, prefer just natives in the gardens, well, you can plant native uh, lantanas, but one or two land, uh, what was I just saying? My mind went blank. What's the flowering bush? <laughs> uh, Lantana? Crucita? Duranta. Uh -huh. Duranta is the one I was thinking of. It's not a native, but it blooms most of the year, especially at times in the summer when very little native stuff is blooming or in the winter. And having a, of course, those froze in the freeze too. Mine was frozen to the ground and had to come back. But having a few plants like that as backup are helpful to butterflies. And, but the main thing we can do to help them is, is to look for, uh, native plants that are host species. Uh, and if you see one ovipositing and you feel comfortable raising the caterpillars, generally they are much safer with you than left out in the wild. And it's a lot of fun to watch them go through the changes and, and emerge as adults. Um, I was thinking, uh, I don't know how many of you heard of this, but uh, with, with some help from my friends, uh, Seth and, and Kat, we raised about 80 Isabella heliconians last fall and released them. And then the freeze came. So, you know, sometimes that happens, but we were hoping to see a, a population ongoing. I, I don't know if any heliconians have, Isabella heliconians have been seen this year. Uh, yes, uh, Martha Jones put in chat, bring in your host plants keep them from freezing. Potted plants um, are used by butterflies just as easily as plants in the ground and certainly by protecting them from freezing, that helps. I don't know any ways to specifically provide shelters for butterflies. I mean, they kind of go where they want to. Uh, if you have even a, a, a tarp up over an area that's high, uh, maybe a sunscreen or something that's higher up, that might protect some plants. But how do you convince the butterflies to go there? I don't know. Um, I don't have any tips on my website per se. You can read my frustrations, reading the, my rearing experiences. But I, I've always thought about doing a presentation on that. So if you all want to invite me back, Maybe in another year or sometime, I'll be glad to present on, on tips for rearing butterflies. Do you have, remember some of the, the first plants that started blooming again after the freeze that maybe they'd be good to plant? Okay. I want, I honestly don't. It might have been uh, Floristina's. But the main one that caught my attention was the, the oxalis. And it's not a plant I would recommend. <laughs> but, you know, it's there. And, they, and the butterflies were desperate. I, I would personally like much better the idea of having some potted lantanas um, and maybe even potted florestina and putting those in the the garage or in the house during the freeze and putting them back out. Uh, I just do not remember what species of native plants came up on their own. 
would something like putting butterfly bait out after the freeze be helpful? Well, the thing is this. The butterflies that drink nectar normally don't go to bait or vice versa. There are a few that will go to both. Uh, but it, it might be worth trying. But generally, the spring flying butterflies are ones that go to nectar. It's the fall, and this is, has to do with the, the course of nature. The ones that tend to feed on bait are the ones that are attracted to rotting fruit. And most rotting fruit is available in the fall. So that's when they tend to be flying and in larger numbers. The, the emperors do fly year round and a few butterflies like that, that will come to nectar. Uh, so bait might help some of them. Um, and certainly it would help like the, the silver and, and Pavon emperors as well. But of course, there's just so few of those. I would just say it's worth putting out, but watch it to see if it's attracting anything because generally at this time of year, I've given up baiting. I just don't get anything. Oh, in chat, uh, Elizabeth said uh, wild petunias came back pretty quick. And uh, okay. on Facebook, uh, Teresa said her mist flowers uh, did pretty good after the freeze. What kind of mist flowers were those? There's a bit of a delay for the Facebook feed, so we'll sure. see if we'll get an answer. Because uh, uh, my crucita froze last year. This year, uh, it's still blooming. Although, again, uh, if you all are were more protected in the valley and didn't get the extreme temperatures we had, yours might have survived. The, oh, the white mist flower might have bloomed fairly early. I'm trying to remember. Coastal mist flower, okay. Yeah, I don't have that one growing. Now, for those that don't see our chat, uh, Martha said that coastal mist flower held up at her school. Uh, and on chat on Facebook, uh, Teresa said it was Gregory's mist flower. Okay, excellent. Okay, Elizabeth put in in chat that that she got a few. Butterflies coming to hummingbird nectar on a sponge. Um, so I guess it makes sounds reasonable then that, uh, especially when you're not in where the extremes that I was at, to, to put out some bait even at this time of year. Yeah, I had um, some little bees attracted to a red spoon. They're just that desperate after the freeze. There was nothing on the spoon at all. Wow. Yeah, for those insects that were flying shortly after the freeze, it had to be rough. Uh, nectar insects, I mean. Okay, are there any other questions? If not, I think that was a wonderful presentation, Barry. Oh, good. Here's Thank your you. website. Good. I was hoping you would uh, present that to us. Forgot to uncover that. So there it is. Uh, LEPS.thenals.net. And it hasn't been updated real recently, but pictures of butterflies. You can look at a group of butterflies, click on and see different pictures. And if I've raised it, there'll be a link there for life history. And I'll explain my experience raising the species. Um, the Satira sulfur won't be up for a while. It's a very busy year. But there are, click on life histories, all the ones that are available are there. Isabella's heliconians, just since I mentioned them. Fantastic pupae, just crazy stuff. The fresh ones. So you're welcome to peruse that. And I'm always open to receiving pictures of caterpillars, butterfly or moth, trying to figure out what they are.
All right. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time and we will probably take you up on that information about raising butterflies. That sounds fascinating. Um, it, it's a good uh, citizen science project where we might help out at times. So, thank you. Um, let's see if there's any other. Yeah, just some th several thank yous uh, showing up in the chat. We did enjoy it and appreciate it. And I'm sure our uh, people on Facebook did too. Since they were they were obviously interacting. So that's great. Yeah, there's a lot of thanks on Facebook too. And Jose Uribe said, uh, how often do you visit Falcon State Park uh, Butterfly Garden? I do not get over there very much, unfortunately. Um, it's so busy, it's just a lot easier just to go out in the yard a little bit at a time and um, once in a while, but not very often. All right. Is he the one that's maintaining it? Because I was over there and saw it was well maintained this year. Yeah, he's in charge uh, of the park. Uh, I don't know if he's the one doing the maintenance, but uh, uh, he's their he's their new superintendent there. Oh, okay. I knew they were in the process. I didn't know he had been hired, so I need to meet him then. <laughs> yeah, and he's also a Texas Texas Master Naturalist. Great. So, okay. Well, we thank you so much and thank you for sharing. And I know in the information we sent out, there's the uh, link to your website there. So people have that um, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. I'm going to change my layout here. Now, before I, mm -hmm. I'm about to be disconnected because it says the app has frozen, so I can't stop sharing. <laughs> oh, it just stopped. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, thank you. And I'm uh, very happy that we were able to overcome the couple of little technical glitches because it was, well, your program was well worthwhile. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead with the business meeting. There's not a whole lot to cover. Um, Let's see, we, I had attached the treasurer's report on even though it is through the, the end of December, there were still some things outstanding and also some items that are being cleared still in January. So we won't have the final um, accounting for last year. Go ahead, uh, Ann. Would you tell the students, they think this might not concern them, but they get credit for attending our general meeting. So. The new students might not know that. Yes, well, I know one of our new students has specifically asked that. And um, yeah, I was looking, uh, it's right at 725, and I think that's close enough to being on the hour. We, uh, you get a full one hour of AT for that program uh, that was presented this evening. And then also, uh, if you hang around for the business meeting, then however much time we spend there, you can count that as chapter business because you'll be attending the business meeting. So for the new students and those that might need reminding, you can um, log in some hours tonight after the meeting. Okay, so there are uh, the treasury reports attached, but we include both the finance report, which is covering this uh, the last month of December, and then the, um, the um, budget and financial report that kind of summarizes the income and expenses we've had um, in year to date. And I do want to mention we had an audit of the books yesterday. It was virtual and that was very successful. We found no irregularities. And uh, so Gail is off the hook for another year. She's been doing a wonderful job and we appreciate all her efforts on that. Um, if you do have questions, I'm sure she'll be glad to answer them. Uh, and um, Otherwise, we will file these uh, treasurer's reports uh, for future audits. We also have the general, uh, mi the minutes of the general meetings, and we did not go over minutes from November um, at our December meeting. We kept it to a minimal. So there are both the November and the December meeting minutes. The December are very brief because about the only business this week conducted was the site of officers that were elected and um, 
that was about it. We talked about the classes a little bit. So there wasn't a whole lot of business conducted that day. And those minutes are uh, were attached and for your review. And if anybody has noted something that needs correcting or changing, uh, you can text Martha or, or me, any of us, and we'll get the word so we can get that corrected and um, have those filed uh, for our historical records. Under committee reports, uh, is, I saw Ronnie was here earlier. There's so many people on, I can't see everybody at one time on the list. So if Ronnie's here for membership, uh, do you have something, something to share with us? Yes, ma'am. Hello, everybody. Y'all are doing well. <clears throat> uh, I am going to share out really quickly. I have a good number of slides open that I take care of. All right, yeah. That's me logging into things. Uh, this is just really quick. Um, I'm going to try, I'm working to get um, a little bit better at having um, like a more formalized report to share out whenever we have our meetings. So we're going to have the same uh, format each time and structure. Uh, so uh, this is a quick recap of where we are for, or where we were um, in 2021 and where we are for uh, this last month and moving forward. So, I think that's fine, if you don't mind, and I don't want to have my sharing throw me off already. So, this is our annual impact uh, summary. This is our, this is for 2021. Uh, again, I took over in, maybe I will uh, view it, and it will be good. There we go. Uh, I took over in July. Um, so, um, been trying to track um, our active members at each uh, at each point, um, but from what I can gather throughout the year, we had up to 90 active members uh, participating <clears throat> in, in our chapter for the year. And those 90 members come from some of those individuals that uh, became initially certified uh, through 2021 from the 2021 class. So up until this point, uh, up until the end of December or last year, we had an additional seven students that were still in training from the 21, 21, uh, 2021 class. So at about 97 members uh, active uh, and uh, able to log hours. So over the course of 2021, we had 67 unique members uh, logging service entry uh, service hours and 38 different opportunities um, were uh what they use to uh, log those hours and kind of gave a quick breakdown of where we are for of what these services look like so we can kind of look get a better look at uh participation uh in the chapter um i don't it's not a it's not a commentary on it it's just a, a reporting of of where of that kind of participation so you can see that uh Committee work and board and chapter uh, meetings comprise the greatest uh, portions of the and the training classes, excuse me, uh, comprise the greatest portions of those entries. Four, four, six point two, and and then kind of breaking down for uh, as we move forward. So hours management is still kind of there, and and all that great stuff. So. This is a quick double up, so I apologize for that. I just I I do a really quick uh, multiplication. And I guess it didn't it didn't uh, stick, so I have to do this. But as a chapter, we had six thousand four hundred and forty six point two total service hours that were logged, approved and logged, which means that when we multiply that by our impact amount per service hour, we have. 183,974 and 55 cents um, worth of impact. So that's a pretty substantial, amazing, and incredible um, amount that uh, our chapter has contributed uh, to 
uh, not just um, our our local area, but to uh, state efforts. Any questions on that? That's great. Yeah. Okay. And then I have our impact for December. So that's this is just all that great stuff. Um, kind of summarized. And this 5,039 is different from that 6,000. So I'm going to keep going back and forth and checking on that. It's It adds up, but then T, the VMS uh, gives a different number too. So I'll just double check that to make sure that we are good. I think what happens is when we report this uh, every month, we get some other entries that are approved after this little snapshot. So that's the slight uh, um, um, difference that we see. So for December 2021, we had uh, 443.5 service hours uh, logged in, and that came from 29 unique members. And that is, uh, and also 10.29, oh, excuse me, 25 uh, AT hours. So that is where our chapter stands uh, at the end of 2021 and moving into 2022. Oh, and one last one. I don't know what was on the slide. Um, 890.95 AT hours logged by the chapter, which is pretty substantial and pretty great. So kudos to everybody um, for uh, all their great efforts uh, and their contributions and uh, looking forward to continuing on and in increasing that further um, into 2022. Thank you. And I do know we, we ha may have some delays because people have 30 to 45 days to post those hours. So we may still be getting some December hours posted. So that, that's mm -hmm. a part of the lag. So, all right. Thank you so much for that information. Mm -hmm. And Anne is class director. Uh, would you like to make some comments? Well, we still have 20 students. Tomorrow night is our second class. We had an orientation class and then first class and tomorrow night's our second class. And Ronnie is going to be talking to the students about logging hours. So they can't do anything yet. They don't know how. So we're going to teach them tomorrow how to log in hours for what they did tonight that they participated in um, going forward from that. And we also have John Brush coming to talk about citizen science, iNaturalist, and eBird. So, and we got a field trip coming up a week from this Saturday. And we've invited the mentors, and I haven't sent, yeah, maybe I did, I'm not sure, sent the invitation out for last year's class. So, if you were in last year's class, 2021, you'll be invited to, to come on our field trip. So, and I'll have the details in my next email. That's it. All right, thank you. How about River and awards and recognition? Hello. Yes, there is one award uh, this month and that is a 1000 hour milestone. And that goes to Stephen Leno. Congratulations, Stephen. It's a great job. Great job. Okay. And I should be having some um, recertifications at, at our next meeting, I'm sure. Uh, I'm there's sure. been a lot of people posting both uh, volunteer hours and AT hours. So that's going to be good. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Under the communications committee, Joseph, do you have any comments there uh, as webmaster or uh, the other duties you do? Um, nothing I can think of just been very busy with all the different stuff, uh, meetings and classes. Uh, I'll try and get back to some reports in the future. That's great. You're doing all the hard work. We're not going to complain if you don't get a report done. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Anita, I know she's been very good. Uh, she was doing, um, uh, uh, blogs and articles, the newspaper. Is she still here? Does she want to, um, um, make a comment about anything, any publications lately? No, she was out of town and trying to join by phone. I'm not okay. sure if she succeeded or not, or it's just watching on Facebook. But, um, well, that's what's up with her. Okay. Well, she's okay. been doing. She's always doing 
doing something awesome. Yeah, she has several um, blog uh, posts per month, and then some articles that uh, she, we post to the uh, our website, and we share them on the uh, our Facebook group and the Facebook page. So uh, if you're looking for them, they should be easy to find. Uh, and there's always something good in there um, about nature or animals, plants, all kinds of stuff that uh, good information for all of us and good to share with other people too. Yeah, I was gonna say, if you go on field trips or do other work or uh, just on your own, get out and do iNaturals or something and want to write up a little article about it, we can put it, post it as a blog on our website and we share and can contribute to the Chakalaka newsletter that our sister chapter is doing. So we're always looking for little articles of interest. So, and you can count writing that up and doing that as volunteer time. So some of you um, new members that if you're interested in writing a little something about a uh, field trip or something, we would welcome that information. Okay, um, other other and director announcements, I wanted to let you know, we did have our annual audit, which was very successful. Um, um, Gail had all of her ducks in a row, like she always does and very complete report. And we found, it, we hunted and hunted and found absolutely no irregularities at all, which was what, exactly what we expected. So we thank her for that time. And we also had an annual retreat where we set some uh, goals for this next year and look back at last year's goals. And that was just yesterday. So we're gonna need a little bit of time to get those notes all organized, but we will share that with the chapter. Um, and did Kathy Tong get on? Is she still on? I didn't know if she wanted a report from the state. Like I say, we had so many on this evening. I was having trouble seeing who all wound up being here. I don't see her and I don't hear from her, um, but the, we do still have um, uh, advanced training going on uh, at the state level. And those are listed under um, AT opportunities in the agenda uh, with the TMN Tuesdays and such. And Keith Monsalon's gonna have presentation. There's water webinars, monarch conservation webinars and even the Native Plant Society of Texas has some presentations virtually. So um, you can look at those opportunities that we listed in the, the agenda and um, keep uh, your eyes on our uh, Google group so that you're aware of that. Um, and then Susan, if you're here, that brings us to volunteer service. Uh, if you wanna say something about uh, volunteer opportunities. I don't think I have anything that I haven't forwarded. Um, and I have not had time since our meeting yesterday to follow up on a couple of things that I will be following up on. So I would say stay tuned because things are picking up in terms of volunteer opportunities. So I will be getting out some stuff as soon as I can get that organized. Okay. In the meantime, if someone is desperate to do something and you're not aware of what you might do, Feel free to reach out to me because I can make some suggestions and our support right. for you. Okay, and we do have the uh, Home and Garden Show coming up. And is Robert still here? Uh, he's kind of in charge of that. Um, so Robert Hernandez, if you're there, he is. If you want to talk here. about that a minute. Yeah, I was lost there for a little bit. Yes, the Home and Garden Show again, uh, that's going to take place April 8th through the 10th. As we approach that date, of course, we're going to be asking for volunteers to uh, take uh, shifts during the show, the three day event. Uh, but for now, we're still in the planning stages. We do plan to use, use it as an informational booth, of course, uh, and at the same time, promoting uh, uh, native plants for the gardens. That's the whole purpose behind this. We do have speakers. Uh, anybody else that would like to uh, uh, to speak about plants, et cetera, having to do with gardens, uh, at, we do have two signed up for that already. If there's anybody else that wants to volunteer for that, let me know also, email me. In the meantime, I think this is a good time to start uh, if you have native plants growing in your gardens 
and you have little plants coming up, you might want to pot them. And uh, that's volunteer time when you uh, uh, when you take time to do that. We do plan to collect uh, as many as we can between now and then. Uh, if we don't have enough, then we can always purchase. I think we have a couple of nurseries that we can use uh, to promote that. Uh, some examples that I have here of what I'm doing at home and uh, myself at home is like this uh, croton plant. About this size, I don't know if you can see it that well there. This is a croton. Good. And I have some salvias growing there also. And I've been potting these. I have maybe about 20 so far. I'm sure I can get about 100 by between now and then. But anything like this that you can uh, help with, Contact me if you're doing that, so I'll know. Keep track of, of what's going on. And I think on Anita's blog tomorrow, I believe uh, she will be uh, uh, writing on that as well, and she's part of the committee. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And like I say, we'll be keeping you posted on that. Um, otherwise, does anybody else on the board or anyone have any announcements? There's Elizabeth. You want to share? Go ahead, Elizabeth. Yes, um, and I'm, I hope you all enjoyed um, the butterfly presentation tonight <laughs> as much as I did. Uh, next month, we um, will be hearing from Charles Alexander, who uh, lives in the Brownsville area. He's been doing research on the native parrots for many years. Um, for some particular individuals that he's followed for years doing research and. Anyway, it should be very, very interesting. So uh, stay tuned. And and like Anna said, uh, you receive tea for uh, for listening to our presentation. So you'll learn a lot. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So our next board meeting is February 7th. And members are always welcome to attend. We are holding them virtually. So if you want to attend, just let Joseph know so he can send you a WebEx invite. And our next general meeting will be February 21st. And um, until further notice, we are continuing virtual. Um, and then we'll be readdressing that later in the spring if things change, it hopefully improve. And with that, are there any other questions or comments? If not, it looks like we are right at 15 minutes or, oh, there's Robert. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, one last thing uh, on the main tags. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, are they uh, magnetic back tap back? I guess magnetic back plates, I guess, and, or the pin type. Most most everybody orders the magnetic, so I took it for granted that's what it was. But specify if you can order. I'm still I have not placed the order till tomorrow, so you still have time. So email me if you still need one. Okay, thank you. So um, we've taken about 15 minutes for the business meeting, which if you record that, it would be 0.25, uh, a quarter of an hour. And um, that's under chapter business, uh, attending the business meeting. So thank you, everyone. Appreciate your attendance and um, look forward to some more great programs. Thank you and have a good evening, everyone.